I'm going to talk a little bit about a question that I've been working on over really, I guess, about 10 years now, and I think we're finally really kind of done with it. So these are my conflicts. None of them are relevant to this uh, talk. So I start with this slide, and you saw the phrase in the title, um, uh, collateral outcomes. And the notion here is that anytime you do surgery, you're causing an injury, and you have to sort of uh, accept that. Uh, no matter how minimally invasive we get and how uh, limited the impact is on our patients, there are aspects of uh, surgery that are injury. And I think you need to go into it with that mindset. And if you start with that, you start to look at uh, the uh, quantity of injury and the quantity of uh, adverse effect that is inevitably created as a result of surgery. So that's where the notion of collateral outcome comes from. So it's, it's something that is an unavoidable consequence of the surgery uh, but is a, uh, and is therefore not a complication. It's not unexpected. It's, in fact, expected. Uh, but it is a source of patient complaint, perhaps a negative impact on the patient, and certainly uh, an, um, uh, an area of concern that they want information about. Uh, and like a lot of things, when I came up with this idea and wanted to sort of start to codify that in spine surgery, I found that uh, other uh, clinical researchers had already uh, touched on this concept. And the, the classification, a famous classification of adverse outcomes or adverse events and complications was put out by Clavian uh, and uh, Strasberg. Steve Strasberg is a actually a friend of mine, a friend of my wife's, and therefore a friend of mine uh, who's a, uh, a, a hepatobiliary surgeon at uh, Wash U now, and he's just recently retired. But uh, he was up at Toronto, which is a famous center for study of uh, uh, adverse effects uh, in a number of different uh, clinical settings. So they use the phrase sequelae. So again, sequelae means it's an automatic negative effect of surgery, and that's sort of the same concept I'm trying to get to with collateral outcomes. So if you start to think about that in uh, orthopedics and spine surgery, iliac, graft, iliac bone graft site pain is one we were just speaking about, Emory was just speaking about. Everyone that has iliac crest harvested has pain at that site. Some people have lingering and persistent pain, but everybody's going to have post-operative pain, and some people continue to complain about pain years after the operation, even when it's done appropriately. Swallowing impacts following cervical fusion. We don't call that an adverse event. But many people will have that at least temporarily, and a number of people will have that permanently following uh, mobilization and uh, denervation to some extent of the esophagus. We know that if you get MRIs on patients that have had a posterior approach, their muscles are never the same after we've been there. And you can see that parts of the muscle are, are devascularized and uh, impacted. Eventually, they become uh, a fatty infiltrate. Uh, that happens no matter how you do a standard posterior approach. This is part of the motivation to use minimal access, right? So again, the study of these kinds of events uh, and these kinds of effects may lead to uh, alterations in the way we do the procedure in order to improve, uh, improve these effects. Uh, anterior knee pain is one from orthopedic residency. I remember if we put in a tibial nail, uh, there's arguments about what starting point to use. Uh, but many patients will come back uh, with pain at the site of the insertion of a tibial nail uh, for a tibial fracture. And finally, the one that I'm speaking about here with respect to spine is loss of motion following joint arthrodesis. And there's a reason we use a, a total hip replacement with motion as opposed to a hip fusion, because a hip fusion is disabling. A shoulder fusion is disabling. And uh, so we want, in those locations, motion-preserving technology. And the question is, is it the same uh, uh, loss of function as a result of fusion in the spine. So clinical outcomes research has really had kind of a blind spot towards these ideas. So all of the, uh, call them legacy outcome tools now for spine, I'm listing three of them here. There are others, but the primary three that we use are osseoastry disability index for, for scoliosis. We use the SRS-22 and the SF-36 or SF-12 now gets a lot of use. All of these are validated and repeatable. All of these are useful, but most of the domains here are aiming at demonstrating the benefits of what we do. So we take somebody and we measure a deficit in function and pain, and then we hope that we're going to see an improvement. So we're not looking with these tools to measure negative impacts, I think, is what I'm getting at there. So it, uh, to extend that further, while pain is a relevant parameter for, for practically all of our patients, I guess there's some deformity patients for whom deformity without pain is an issue, but almost everybody that's undergoing spine, spine surgery has neurologic deficit and pain. Uh, but there are other issues that may affect function and satisfaction with the treatment. And many patients I've found, and I think anybody who has uh, 
done spine surgery and proposed fusion to surgeons to sorry to patients for for long recognizes that many patients come in asking us how will I be affected if we do a lumbar spine fusion and their uh, their their sort of their foundational principle is won't I be stiff and how much will I be able to do after you fuse my spine uh, and in fact some patients after their fusions do complain about stiffness, and that's something, that's really what led to the uh, interest in this topic. And early on, I had a couple of small uh, endeavors. One was a small uh, set of patients that I, uh, that I had operated on with long fusions and found that they came back, one of the things uh, that really bothered them after those fusions was that they couldn't, uh, they couldn't clean themselves after toileting. They, they were unable to perform personal hygiene uh, after toileting, and that's something you don't really think about, uh, but when you can't do it, you think about it a lot, it turns out. Uh, so you really miss it if you can't do it. So these patients were quite bitterly affected by the inability to wipe themselves after toileting. Uh, and um, we proposed that, I wrote that up with a small series of questions just on that function and uh, uh, submitted it. And one of the reviewers of the first uh, go-rounds with that paper said, oh, the author should use a validated or establish a validated and um, repeatable qu questionnaire rather than just ad hoc uh, three questions they were asking. And at the time, I thought, well, that's ridiculous, you idiot. Why, didn't you understand what I was trying to say? But as I thought more about it, I thought, well, maybe so. And so that led to developing a larger questionnaire, and I'll get to that in a minute. This patient on the right is another patient from around that era, and uh, she was interesting. And again, it was particularly with respect to this perineal care issue. Uh, she was self-inserting a rectal suppository uh, uh, sometime after her fusion and she heard a pop and indeed she had fractured the vertebral body in the center of her construct uh, as a result of straining to uh, reach around uh, to perform that function. So that function is definitely limited if you don't have uh, lumbar uh, mobility for a number of patients. So uh, this should inform decision making and we have patients who come in asking for retained motion and it, it may lead to different procedures performed or proposed for them and these are a couple of examples that illustrate that. So this is a woman that I took care of now a number of years ago. It's been been a number of years since I saw her, but uh, she was very concerned about her lumbar mo mobility because she made her living as a ballet instructor. Uh, she was very flexible and in very good condition, and she had this uh, problem of really a small, short segment um, uh, scoliosis, really opposing curves. And you can see there's really only two degenerative discs. The upper one was stenotic and symptomatic from the stenosis. The lower one was primarily discogenic back pain. Uh, but you also have this uh, small curve scoliosis as a result of that. Uh, you know, if all things being equal, my reflex would be to do a pan lumbar fusion. But clearly, uh, with her age and function, that was not the right choice. And I didn't think we had to on the basis of her pathology. So we did an operation that I've probably done, oh, I've done it now one other time. So I've done this for two patients now. She was the first, uh, two separate one level T lifts. And uh, she got a very nice result. And here she is at three months in my office uh, demonstrating what she can do uh, flexibility wise. And I've shown these at spine. Uh, conferences and been told, well, she's not really moving through her back. So I guess for the skeptics, I'll grant that. But uh, I'm not sure that if we'd been doing it, if we'd have done a 10, 10 to the pelvis fusion, that she'd be doing even this much activity at three months postoperatively. And she ended up delighted with the outcome. And I've seen her out through at least five years postoperatively. Again, it's been a number of years now. This is another lady uh, who has, again, primarily a one-level fusion. She has an idiopathic curve above a high-grade spondy that had been fused as a child, and now she has a, a lytic spondy uh, at 4 or 5 above that. Uh, she was a nurse, and we talked about doing a short-segment fusion and just treating her pathology, and she really preferred, even with the notion of, of, uh, of stiffness, that we perform an entire fusion, and so we uh, ended up with a T10 to the pelvis fusion. And again, based on her expectations and her desires, she's been happy with that. I guess the point is, I don't know how to inform these patients, how is this going to be different if we fuse your whole spine versus a couple of segments? Are you going to have more limitations uh, with one or the other, and how much and in what way? So we developed the Lumbar Stiffness Disability Index, and I use that name in uh, kind of analogy to the Oswestry Disability Index, and it's very similar in structure to the Oswestry Disability Index. So it's 10 functional domains, 
uh, a range of one to four per, uh, qu per question. But instead of referring the patient to the effects of low back and leg pain, we refer the patient to the effects of low back stiffness on performing these functions. And here's an example. Choose the statement that best describes the effect of low back stiffness on your ability to bend to your feet and put on your underwear and pants while dressing independently, zero to four. And then we scale that up to, one to, to 100 points. And here are the other, um, the other aspects of daily living, shoes and socks, ability to drive, uh, personal hygiene, again, following toileting, uh, picking something up off the floor, getting in and out of bed, getting in and out of a deep chair, bathing your body, getting in and out of your car, and sexual intercourse, also part of uh, ODI. So the first step once you've developed something like this is to establish that it is valid and that it has sound psychometric properties, and those include internal consistency, test, retest, reliability, uh, validation, which in this case we used external validation from flexion extension uh, radiographs, and then you want to get some sort of normative data so you know uh, are people that have no complaints of lumbar spine, does this essentially register zero for that uh, set of patients? And uh, these are some of those data, and I'll move through these quickly, but these are the, uh, con the internal consistency with measure with the Crohn's back alpha, which came out at 0.9, that's very high. So that means the questions all travel together. If you're low on one score, you're low on the rest. If you're high on one score, you're high on the rest. So they all move uh, in similar fashion. Interclass correlation uh, coefficient has to do with repeatability, and again, very high here, 0.928 uh, when we submitted the, the questionnaire twice to the same patients. And this is the, the graphical display of the test, retest, re repeatability. You see that the numbers end up very consistent uh, on two different, um, two different measurements. And then we uh, validated it by, uh, uh, in a set of um, retrospective patients who had all had fusions and all solidly healed, and we got um, uh, flexion extension radiographs on them. I guess one critique here is we didn't have patients that did not have flexion extension radiographs. But what you can see is the uh, range of motion under voluntary flexion extension from the radiographs does correlate with how they perceive their uh, stiffness uh, limitations. So uh, not a perfect correlation, but enough to hang your hat on and say this is measuring something real with respect to lumbar spine mobility. And we submitted it through the ISSG to a number of uh, asymptomatic patients. And you can see that we uh, do see that there's a rise in the score with age. So as you get over uh, 50, and th these include the, the, the asymptomatics are the group below, the line below. So uh, all of the asymptomatic patients, even the older ones, had relatively limited complaints, uh, r barely rising above five. Uh, so maybe a little bit of stiffness uh, uh, as we get older, but not, uh, not nearly as much as the patients uh, that you see above that have spinal complaints. And uh, we've got two arms there. One is a group of patients that we operated on. You see they all uh, have, uh, and particularly in the older group, have substantial complaints of stiffness. The non-operative group, uh, less affected, which is not surprising given that they're, the, the reason they chose, since they're not randomized, the reason these patients weren't operated on is they're less disabled. So we then took this questionnaire and applied it to a retrospective uh, group of patients that we'd already operated on. These were all my patients at uh, OHSU a number of years ago, and uh, we uh, looked at the ODI scores in the same group of patients. We delivered both instruments to the same patients a year out. Uh, this just shows that uh, we had similar um, uh, that the patients were demographically similar, and we used a number of different fusion levels. So these are patients that had one level of fusion, two levels of fusion, three, four, or five levels of fusion. Uh, I rarely now will do a four-level fusion, and all of the five-level fusions here are patients that have more than five, so typically T10 to the pelvis, as opposed to, um, as opposed to just, say, L1 to uh, sacrum. And what we found was that, uh, that there, while there was a correlation between ODI and LSDI, it really was very similar across the whole cohort. So uh, patients that had had, uh, uh, independent of how many levels of fusion patients has had, their ODIs ended up very similar, whereas as we increased the number of segments fused, we found a statistically significant difference between uh, the, the pairwise comparison between patients with one level of fusion and those with five or more, uh, suggesting that as you have more fusion in your spine, you do f experience more uh, disability due to stiffness. So at this point, uh, we felt we had a valid, consistent, and reliable tool to measure the impact with respect to fusion on uh, stiffness impairments. Uh, we felt that we had demonstrated that patients 
uh, with significant spine degenerative disease as well as uh, following fusion uh, report significant stiffness limitations. And while LSDI and ODI are correlated, they uh, are measuring different uh, functional domains, and so they're not duplicate measures. So we then started, again, this was a single center prospective study, again, with multiple levels of fusion from one to five levels, multiple diagnoses. Almost all of these were either uh, revision, um, revision patients, uh, discogenic back pain, uh, deformity, or spondylolisthesis. That's really the, the, the four diagnoses represented here. And these were all followed out to two years minimum follow-up. And uh, this, again, is the cohort, relatively similar ages across the, uh, the uh, procedures, slightly younger among the, among the uh, one-level fusions. Uh, but, uh, and there is, com there were, we did use combined approaches more in the five or more level fusions as opposed to poster only for uh, almost all of the patients with one and two level fusions. You can see three or four, we had a very small group of patients here. So really this comes down to three cohorts, one level fusion, two level fusions, and five or more level fusions. And these are the changes in the LSDI and the ODI, and there's some interesting things here. If you look in the column on the left, uh, the one-level fusions, actually the LSDI, the, res the stiffness limitations are reduced following a one-level fusion. So these are patients uh, that uh, come in with pain and experience as a result of pain a loss of mobility because they're not able to move their spine comfortably and therefore perceive it as stiffness is how we put it together. And you fuse them, you take away their pain, and even though you've taken away motion at one segment, they're actually more flexible because they've got all these other uh, levels now that they have access to. The two-level fusions barely change from baseline, and I'm going to skip over with three and four because it's such small numbers, but if you look at the five-level fusions, there was a, an increase in the stiffness. That's what's shown in the left column, uh, and that almost, re, almost reached significance, but not quite. <clears throat> If you look at ODI and the PCS functional score uh, out of the SF36, uh, those, those scores all trended towards improvement for all four groups of fusion patients and all actually as a mean reached MCID differences in, uh, in every aspect. And this is a graphical representation, which I think is a, a nice way to look at this. If you, the red line is the LSDI score, and you can see, again, for the one-level fusions, the LSDI score actually decreases from baseline. Uh, at two levels, it stays about the same, seems to increase slightly for three or four. Again, those are very small numbers of patients, and then does increase nearly significantly for the five and more level fusions. Uh, on the other hand, the PCS, which a positive change uh, is a, a good thing, shows a positive change across all groups. L the ODI, where a negative change is a good thing, shows a negative change across all of the fusion groups. And here's a couple of cases out of that. This is a, a, a male patient that we did um, uh, that we did just a one-level fusion for a degenerative uh, uh, spondylolisthesis. Uh, and again, his LSDI score actually decreased, ODI down 13, and PCS up 3.4 at two years postoperatively from that. So we benefited him with respect to his stiffness. Here's a woman who uh, is decompensated uh, in the sagittal plane as well as coronal plane, and we did a T4 to the pelvis fusion on her. And LSDI rose modestly by five points, but ODI again down 12.5 and PCS uh, up 2.5. And then an important part of this study was to ask these three questions about their uh, satisfaction. So one is, do you, do you in fact consider low back stiffness to be a significant limitation on daily activities? Knowing what you know now, would you undergo the same procedure again? And do you consider low back stiffness resulting from your surgery to have been an acceptable trade-off for the improvements in pain and overall function. And we found that about a third of patients said yes, uh, no matter how many levels we had fused, a third of the one-level fusion said uh, they, they did experience significant uh, functional limitations. Higher numbers, uh, interestingly, for the two, three, and four-level fusions, the, the greater than five-level fusions said about the same percent. About a third said yes, stiffness affects me. But if you look at the numbers in the last two uh, sets of rows, 90 to 100% in every category, uh, excepting the two-level fusions who for some reason were un unhappy. And it's, a, again, a really, relatively small group, but only 75% of them said they were accepting the trade-offs despite their numbers being about the same as a group. But you can see that almost all happy with the trade-offs and would make the same choice again. So I think that finally informs us that we can tell people, you may experience some stiffness, but it's going to be, a, uh, in, in almost every case, it's, it's uh, seen as worth the trade-off of reduction in pain.
So if we update now, the perceived stiffness seems to be no worse uh, or maybe even a bit better when we do short segments of one and two levels of fusion. Uh, it does seem to increase for multi-level fusions. Uh, the LSDI does track separately from ODI and pain-related outcomes, but patient satisfaction very high despite those effects. So finally, we kind of weighed it in in a multi-center uh, fashion through ISSG, and this was the first study I uh, really proposed. We brought this um, questionnaire into our initial uh, cohort of patients as we began building our, um, our uh, prospective database. And we've ultimately found that for spinal deformity, even with fusions to T10 or to T4, uh, these patients really are happy and aren't significantly worsened, even though my single center data seem to suggest they might be, they really are not worsened whether, no matter where you stop the, the fusion. So we, we split this into two groups. One were patients that were fused from the pelvis to upper thoracic spine, about 50 patients, and then those that were fused from uh, lower thoracic or thoracal lumbar junction to pelvis. And you can see there were really no differences in the cohorts, and this is the pre baseline data. So they come in, if you look at the LSDI there, these are LSDIs over 30 mean. So they're already very stiff and having significant effects. And that, again, I think is why they don't experience significant change is because they come in quite disabled. And you can see they're almost as affected by their LSDI in terms of the point number as they are with respect to their ODI, only within about 10, 10 points uh, of the ODI means and those are the other means, so none of these different between the two groups. And we found very little change. If you look at the first row across, LSDI actually, you know, I'd call these all no change. So up 2.4 points for the upper thoracic, down actually almost four points for, as a mean for the thoracal lumbar patients, whereas the ODIs decreased 17 and 19 points. The SRS 22 is a, rel a really small uh, scale, but up significantly for... Uh, for the um, total score for both groups and uh, the PCS, again, functional score from SS36 up significantly for both groups. And here's an, another couple of examples. This is a patient that we did a T10 to the pelvis fusion, uh, and these are both my patients, and his LSDI changed modestly with an increase to three, but ODI down 12, functional PCS five, up five, and SRS significantly changed as well. Here's a, a, a different example of a woman that we took up to the upper thoracic spine, and her LSDI, again, a relatively modest increase of 7.5, ODI down 24 for her, and PCS much more functional, up 14. And we did do a satisfaction correlation. This is, there's a satisfaction score out of the SRS 22 that we use that's just two questions, and we found that it was extremely um, uh, uncorrelated with the final LSDI scores. So uh, even patients that are uh, very stiff out here, 60, 70, 80 points on the LSDI score, uh, still remain very satisfied with the outcomes of these procedures. And we finally, after putting this out and uh, talking about it for several years, we've had some some um, some other researchers contact us. Uh, one was Heiko Kohler, who's uh, I think known to some of the uh, Jens and some of the other surgeons maybe in the room um, from Germany, and he proposed looking at L5 stopping point uh, versus going to the pelvis, which was actually a question I'd always wanted to answer, but we didn't have the patients in the ISSG database to do that. So he had a number of patients that he had fused to L5 with long constructs. We had the form translated into German and applied it to his patients. So this is a retrospective comparison, and it's across two cultures, but we found that the final LSDI scores, whether we stopped at L5 or went to the pelvis, were almost identical, as you see on the right there. And since then, we've had uh, some researchers in uh, Japan have also adopted this, and uh, that data has not yet been published, but uh, it's starting to get some traction in uh, the Japanese population as well. So my final conclusions, I think stiffness impacts for pan lumbar fusion don't significantly worsen, significantly worsen uh, function, and they don't uh, significantly drive satisfaction. It doesn't matter whether we stop in thoracal lumbar junction or go to upper thoracic spine in terms of the effect on perceived stiffness, and whether we retain L5-S1 as a motion segment does also not seem to reduce stiffness impacts uh, to any substantial degree. And then since we are uh, here, I think uh, a number of the audience are still in training. I think I have that right. I know at least our fellows are here. So I'll, I'll start with a couple final thoughts, and one is to respect your teachers. And I guess I always include that because I am one, but, uh, but um, uh, it's something that uh, I didn't feel when I was in your seat as strongly as I do now 20 years on. And uh, 
thinking back about my own teachers uh, and my own mentors and how much I was able to learn and take forward from them. And I think the more respect you give your teachers, the more you'll get out of that relationship. And the second thing is learn from your mistakes. And I think if, we're, if you're not reflective about what works and what doesn't work in your practice, and uh, you know, I, I also tell our fellows and residents, when you finish your training, you're really not finished your, uh, your learning. And you, you're not going to continue if you aren't paying attention to what you're doing. So you really need to listen to your patients, look at your outcomes, look at your x-rays, and really learn from your mistakes. And um, the, last, uh, the last thing I always try to impart is the most important thing you can learn in residency and fellowship is not the facts and the techniques that you take away, but it's the, the process of how to think for yourself and how to improve your own abilities over time. So these are some acknowledgments. And I thank my family for letting me come out on a Sunday morning. Thank <clears throat> you.